All right. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to our uh, first Lunch and Learn of 2021. Um, seems a little crazy to be saying that, but boy, are we glad to be in 2021. <laughs> um, and uh, welcome to our, I believe this is our sixth um, in our series um, with Dr. Lynn Johnson and really focusing on uh, diversity and inclusivity um, and just such a long, an important topic um, for all of us in the business community for really a long time, um, but certainly something that has um, become the forefront of the national conversation and um, something very important for us to all be focusing on. So really want to thank all of you for signing uh, into today's call. Uh, we have learned a lot in the previous five um, seminars that we've done, which if you missed any and would like to go back and watch are all up on the Chamber's YouTube channel. Um, and so you can feel free to go back and, and listen to those while you're multitasking. Um, but I am very excited about today's topic, um, which is confronting unconscious bias. Am I'm not biased or am I? And I think, um, you know, through a lot of, of the conversation over 2020, a lot of us found ourselves saying, well, thank goodness I'm not. And then you start to really reflect and say, well, am I? You know, are there things either in my upbringing or um, uh, in my, you know, communities that I was raised or whatever it might be that might be impacting my outlook on the world and I don't even realize it or, or I haven't come to that realization um, of it. So we are super excited to have Dr. Lynn Johnson with um, Triumphant Solutions um, that will be leading our uh, seminar today. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, pitch it over to Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. And as Katie said, Happy New Year. And thanks, Katie, for that great opening. It was wonderful. Great opening to what we're going to be talking about today. And I just want to say thank you for taking your time out to come and just spend a little bit of time with me to talk about a very serious, um, very serious topic today. And um, so we'll spend about the next 45 minutes kind of go, going over some information. And I'm even going to open it up at one point just to kind of hear a little bit from you guys. But I don't want to prolong the time because I know that you guys are probably on your lunch. And as I said on my last call, that if you are on your lunch, I hope that you're eating, but that you are definitely listening in um, to the call today. So you might you know, ask, well, who is Dr. Johnson? Well, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I um, actually born and raised Lake Wells. So I've been around uh, here a long time. And so I am uh, born and bred right here. But I have quite a, 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 an array of background. I come from 15 years at a um, large insurance company that I worked for for quite a long time and um, had great experiences there. And I've been in higher education for the last 10 years. And what I did is I basically opened up my own consulting firm where I provide HR uh, management services to small organizations because I believe that um, HR is where the heart is. That's the tagline on my um, on my signature on my email because I really truly believe that and I believe that if you take care of your people your people will take care of you and so I have spent uh, years uh, working with small businesses years researching and learning everything that I can in order to make my clients uh, better at what they do and just successful in all of the goals that they have set for themselves and so I, I handle a, an array of things um, dealing with HR. But I'm not going to spend the time today talking about me. If you want to know more about me, you can always hit me up if you, if you want to have more conversation. But today's topic is, um, is very, very important. We're going to be talking about how we can confront biases, specifically unconscious bias today, um, which is also known as implicit biases. So we'll cover what unconscious bias is. We'll also look at what the research says are the most common biases in the workplace, where it shows up in the workplace in the, in the work that we do. We'll also look at some strategies though of how we can actually 
disrupt unconscious bias in our workplaces. Now, I use my hands a lot. And so um, I apologize if that uh, distracts anyone, but that's just kind of the person that I am. That's my personality. And so I like to use my hands a lot. But um, let's just dig in. And any, if you do have a question and you want to stop me, I'm really okay with that. And so just let Katie and Amanda know by just putting a message in the um, in the chat here. So let's let's begin. I always like to begin with a quote, and of course, I like to find a quote that really speaks to what we're talking about. So this quote says, "Me biased, unconscious bias is like jealousy. Nobody likes to admit it." and often we're aware of it. This quote really speaks to what we are going to be talking about today, because as Katie has already uh, stated, 2020 was really that eye-opening year, right? That really just threw it in our faces to say, hey, are we, am I really biased? Am I really dealing with, uh, do I really see the world in a different you know, in a different light. And so we'll know that, or we'll find out today that research shows that we all, regardless of gender or race, we perceive and we treat people based on the things that we have associated with that race or with that gender or with that social group. You know, studies have shown that implicit bias or unconscious bias begins at a very young age. And so over time, what happens is it becomes replicated and it, it's reinforced so often that we don't even see it as biases. That's just the way that it is, you know, and the biases aren't just about race or ethnicity, because what I've learned over the years is that when you hear the word bias, you automatically think about race. It, it's always the thing that comes to the forefront of your mind, but it's it's really not just about race or ethnicity, but it's about, um, it, it could be about a minority status, it can be about your sexual orientation, it could be about your gender, even your weight, your age, your, uh, your status, your disability, and even height. Um, I'm sure we have some HR folks on the line that have also done some research and that have that have seen all of the studies that show it's what what amazes me is the height, uh, the height studies out there where it shows that people that are taller are typically um, seen as people that are smarter or have more, uh, they're stronger leaders and therefore it, it's reflected in how much they get paid, right? So there are so many studies that show that this is relevant and it's really relevant in, in today's time. But why is that? You know, why is that the case? Why do we have these biases? Why, why is it that way? So we got to blame it on the brain. Blame it on the brain. Because our brain says, as you can see, just from this slide, just from this, this little simple clip art here, that 95% of your mind is unconscious. It's unconscious, 95%. That's a lot in our brains. And so our brains, what happens is, is it has to handle so much information. And studies say that it's about 11, that the brain takes in about 11 million pieces of information at any point in time. Think of that, 11 million pieces of information. But our brain can only process 40 pieces of information at any given time. You can see that in the disparity of these numbers here on the slide. So in order to manage it all, what has to happen is our brain, they, the, our brain does the job of basically uh, chunking things up, right? Or looking for patterns and they filter, um, our brain filters for us what it sees as the most important bits of information. So it's like taking shortcuts or putting our brain kind of goes on autopilot. So anything that's familiar to the brain, it, it, that is what our brain typically functions on. So we don't have to think through every single thing that happens. Think about if you had to really think through how to brush your teeth every day. Think about how long it would take for us just to do something as simple as brushing our teeth. 
but the brain has these shortcuts so that simple things that's familiar to us, like getting up every day, brushing our teeth, that's, that's a shortcut, right, that the brain takes. So the brain sees these patterns. They're based on accumulative effect. And this is just some information um, that is important for us to know. So it looks at all of the things that have happened over our lifetime the whole thing, everything that happens over our lifetime. And what happens is everything that happens over our lifetime, it's in the back of our minds. So we're not even aware of what's going on in our mind when things are happening and when we have to make certain decisions. So this can cause us to basically behave in ways that are not true to who we want to be. I like that statement that it, uh, it causes us, the way that our brain operates, causes us to behave in the way that is not true to who we want to be, who we want to be deep down inside, or how we feel we are, or how we feel uh, we respond to different things. So I, I was reading a study the other day, because I do a lot of reading, and I do a lot of uh, research and that there was this professor at the Ohio State University Medical College. And I want to read to you something that he said. He said, the first time a human saw an animal, they didn't know. They, any the first time that they saw an animal that they didn't know, they just naturally assumed it was dangerous. And he added, the thought could be, if I don't know what it is and it doesn't look like me or those I know, then I'm going to stay away from it. But he says, this, is a, this was a good thing back then, but in 2020, we can't do that because so many people don't look like us. So many people don't talk the way that we do. So many people don't come from the backgrounds that we come from. So we cannot just uh, put in our minds that everybody is the same, or if they're not like me, then I have to assume something about them that might not be true. And this is where biases come from. So as we look at biases, what I want us to do, I'm going to go really elementary here for a minute. So please forgive all of the HR experts that's on the line today. I'm really going to go elementary because I want us to really look at the, the term unconscious behavior, so I, I mean unconscious bias, so I want to break it down. So when we look at unconscious bias, let's look at the words themselves. Unconscious, what does it mean? It means you're unable to respond. It means comatose, someone that is not conscious. Now let's look at some synonyms for bias. Prejudice, bigotry. Racism, sexism. Now, to me, this word is not sounding so good, right? But I just told you that everyone has biases, right? That we may not even be aware of. But this word really doesn't sound that good. But if we look at the actual definition of unconscious bias, what it's defined as, it's defined as prejudice or unsupported judgments in favor of or against one thing, person, or group as compared to another in a way that is usually considered unfair. Now, I underline the word unsupported. Unsupported judgments is very important in this definition because this is what these two words, unsupported judgments, are two words that really have the biggest impact on your organization. Unsupported. That means that we're going based off of our own assumptions, what we think, based only on what we know. And what do we really know? You know, what do we really know? And, and what are we basing it on? Are we basing it on our upbringing? Are we basing it on uh, the education that we've received, what are we really basing things on? So assuming that you are not biased in any way makes you actually more biased. And I believe that 
it's important for us to understand and to know that it is okay to be biased because we're all biased in some form or fashion. It's where the problem is, is the people that deny it. The people that deny, or they're the ones that's going around and say, saying things like, oh, I treat everybody the same. I hope that's not you saying that. You know, I treat everybody the same, or I know I hired the right person because I treat everyone fair, right? So assuming you don't have the problem only makes it worse. Because study after study, research after research shows that unconscious bias is a fact of life. But where does it show up in our workplace? So let's look at something. So unconscious bias, we're going to look at where it shows up and what effects it has on the workplace. So the different areas where it shows up, it shows up in our recruiting methods or our recruiting decisions, shows up in interviewing and selection shows up in relationships at work, the different cliques that are at work. Just think about your workplaces and the different cliques. We see it, we just don't say anything about it. Performance reviews, promotions, our interactions with our external customers, our interactions with our internal customers. So studies show that recruitment interviewing, all of these things listed here is where unconscious biases can show up. So if you think about your position at work, whether you are a person in HR, whether you are someone on the, on the, the call today where you are actually a, uh, you manage an entire company or you own a company, these are the areas where unconscious bias can show up. And it shows up in our processes. It shows up in the way that we make decisions in our workplace. You know, and we, we have to be aware and conscious of everything that we do when it comes to making decisions in our workplace. So for many organizations, identifying as many um, as what we have to do is we have to identify as many, uh, many ways, right, that biases can show up and be and have and be intentional. I'm going to use the word intentional to ensure that we are not causing um, an environment for unconscious biases to run rampant in our organization. So let's look at what research says affects the workplace. So we're going to look at different biases that impact the, uh, the workplace. So we're going to look at infinity bias real quick, halo effect, perception bias, confirmation bias, and uh, we'll look at groupthink as well. And the reason why I chose these, because these are the most common, now there are plenty, guys, there are plenty, but these are just a few of the most common biases in your workplace. So when we look at infinity, affinity bias, and you say, well, what is affinity bias? Well, affinity, affinity bias is when you have the tendency to warm up or to like or to be drawn to people that's just like us, that's just like you, right? So you, um, people that go to the same school that you went to, your alma mater, right? Or people that come from the same neighborhood that you come from, or um, people that have very similar um, very similar ways of, uh, not ways of doing things, but people that are just like who we are. So we are drawn to these type of people. So think about where something like this can show up in your workplace. Just think about in the situation of interviewing. You could be interviewing two people with um, pretty much all of the same um, the same quali qualifications, but one may have graduated from the same alma mater that you graduated from. Research says that you're going to be more prone toward that, per that uh, person than the other person, or you're going to reflect differently on that person than the other person. That's just what uh, research shows. Now, when we look at something like halo effect, this is the tendency to think everything about a person is good just because you like 
So if I like Katie because she is, you know, she's just a great person. I've had great um, interactions with her. So everything about her is good. Everything. And I don't see anything different because I like her. So it doesn't open us up. It doesn't open me up to a different side of Katie, right? So I'm just, oh, well, Katie could do anything in Lynn's eyes because it doesn't matter. She likes Katie, right? So that's what halo effect is. And when we look at perception bias, this is the tendency to form stereotypes and assumptions about certain groups that make it impossible to make an, um, an objective judgment about those people in those groups. The tendency to form stereotypes. This is so, this is to me a very common bias that goes on in the workplace. And not just in the workplace, just in life in general. Because we have so many stereotypes that, and we put people in boxes based on stereotypes. And if you fall in that category, whether you're like that or not, then you are perceived to be that way, right? Perceived to be that way. And um, I'm gonna be transparent here because uh, uh, I have a son of, uh, and he's, he's 17, um, he's 17 years old and he's a senior in high school, and he is uh, a really good kid. I'm not just saying he's a good kid because he's my kid, but he is a really good kid, very respectful. He has a job. Um, you know, he, he does well in school, um, but he, but his hair is in dreadlocks. And so um, when he wanted them, I was like, no, you cannot get dreadlocks. He's like, mom, why not? I said, you can't get dreadlocks because when people see you, they're going to assume that you are a thug because you have dreadlocks. They're going to assume that you're just <laughs> some thug in the street. So no, you cannot have dreadlocks. But remember what I said in my last um, session that we had when we talked about value and diversity and cultural competence and how um, you have to be aware of what's going on but you this this generation that's coming up his friends don't care his you know they don't care what he looks like so but I but I know that other people from other generations might care what he looks like and it may affect him in certain ways but I had to get out of that way of thinking and I allowed him to get, you know, to, to, to get the dreadlocks. I was transparent because I did, because people that are stereotyped know that they're stereotyped, right? So, um, so it doesn't just affect us in the workplace. It also affects us in our personal lives as well. And so, um, so it's very important that we try not to put, to put people in boxes, right? To put them in different stereotypes. Um, confirmation bias, the tendency for people to seek information that confirms your pre-existing beliefs. So if you feel a way, feel a certain way about a certain group, that is the way that you are going to, when you come across that type of person, you're going to seek information that confirms what you already believe. And there is a fantastic study out there that people still use today where there was a study that was done on some law firms where the firms were giving a legal memo that included grammatical errors, factual, uh, factual errors, technical errors, and half of the people that did the memo were black and the other half were white or that's what the law firm, the, the firm partners knew that half would come from blacks and half come from white. So when the memo was perceived to be from black authors, the law firm partners found more errors and rated them lower quality than the ones that were from the, uh, the white authors. So this, this study was about race, right? But that's just one way. 
that is there there are other ways that we can have confirmation biases so we have to be careful that we are not looking for things that are going to um confirm our beliefs about a particular group or a particular you know uh person and then group think is one that we're all familiar with especially all of the hr folks on the line and anyone that's um that has worked with people and, and different fo uh, focus groups one of the things that you do not want to happen is group think this is where um people try try too hard to fit into a particular group so what happens when people try too hard to fit in one group they lose a part of themselves so that person loses a part of their identity and what it does for the organization if a person loses a part of their identity or they feel that they cannot be creative or they feel that they cannot be innovative because they're trying too hard to fit in a particular group, then the company loses this creativity. The company loses this innovation. And then that can affect the workplace. So I'm gonna just take a quick minute here and just open up the floor just to see if, um, if, if you, if you have any examples maybe that you have or you think you may have been um, involved with unconscious bias that you that you feel okay sharing, you know, today. So an example that could probably help, you know, the others that are on the call. If you if you want to, Katie's going to um, allow you can unmute yourself and um, just tell us anything that you feel that an example of something that you've come across in your time, whether it was you personally, or whether it was things that um, in the in the workplace that you do, your you know your job, anybody, don't you, don't be shy. And you can unmute yourself, guys. So um, I saw Joanne that you unmuted yourself. Do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, a long time, well, many years ago, I worked in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was a common practice uh, to never show up on time for a meeting. And uh, it, was, it was accepted. Well, I carried that memory uh, of what actually occurred uh, to my existing business today. And a large part of our population that comes through as applicants for testing are Latin, uh, from various places in Latin America, but including Puerto Rico. I assume they're going to be late. It is, and when they're not, I'm delighted, but that that is something that's a, a, a bias that I have learned and um, it's not fair to the individual because if a person shows up late, the secondary thought is they're not going to do very well. So um, I can understand that whole idea of confirmation bias mm -hmm. and um, the, the halo effect and so forth. It's real. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something on that same line? <clears throat> um, one of the things that I know that as a black person, people, that's the perception that we're always late. You know, we don't show up on time. It's uh, CP time. You hear that a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And I resent that because it's like we're individuals and I'm one of those individuals that I'm always, always early. You know, that's, I, I have a, 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 a problem when people are late because uh, your my time is valuable and so is yours. So you should, you know, and completing tasks, being on time, uh, uh, not being late for assignments, that's something that uh, they're, gonna, they're always late. You get that type of bias that exists. And also sometimes the way people uh, act, they assume that that everyone act that way or put you in that box. And so that's the things that we're always, always trying to break through that treat, get to know the individual and what they bring to the table, you know, as opposed to putting them in a box. And those are the kind of things that you see a lot that 
as you were talking about the hair, the way you wear your hair, the way, you know, those types of things. Uh, your culture has a lot to do with that. And you should be, when you bring the whole person to the workplace, creativity does exist. That's my statement. Yes, thank you, thank you, Joanne. I, I appreciate those, those, um, those examples because, you know, it's real. You know, it's, it's real. We, unfortunately, we all have biases. And once we realize that we do, then that's the first step of, of uh, fixing it, right? It's the first step of us saying to ourselves, hey, you know, I didn't know this, but I'm glad that I do because I'm going to be intentional right? I'm going to be intentional on not being that way. So I'm going to make a conscious effort that I am fair in everything I do, fair in all the decisions that I make, that I take any biases that I have and, you know, put them to the side. So thank you. Thank you so much for those examples. So please, Dr. Johnson, we have one more hand raised. Vanessa, you had raised your hand. Did you want to make a comment? Yes, um, I thought the comments were very interesting. Joanne, um, uh, my family comes from Puerto Rico. Um, so what you were speaking of, I'm very, uh, I should say, accustomed to that. As a matter of fact, even at parties, if you tell someone your party's at five o'clock, if people will show up at 6.30, 7 o'clock, if they were to actually show up at the party time at five o'clock, everybody else would be shocked. It would actually be kind of rude to be there on time. So it's just really interesting the whole how cultural differences um, are just so different and just so, you know, what, what is okay in one culture is not okay in another culture. Now, my parents were very much like what you had mentioned, Christine. My parents were always on time or very, very, very early. So they would resent that type of stereotype um, I wish I could say I was more like them. Um, I'm, I'm not. I try to be as much as I can. Um, but I just find this whole conversation very interesting because culture does play a huge part in, in, in this. So this is my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. And what, what Vanessa said is, uh, I like how she tied both of them, you know, together. But guys, we have to realize that we bring all of our biases to work with. And for anyone to be in denial would be detrimental to your organization. I'm very um, passionate about that. Um, but let's move on because I want to get to some more stuff. So what, so we know we see where it shows up. We see the, the different biases that have actual effects on our workplaces. And again, these are just some, there are more that do. But let's look at the impact of unconscious bias. What does it do to your organization? Well, I'm gonna tell you, and you guys, if you were on my last call, you know that I love statistics and I didn't, I didn't uh, inundate you guys with statistics on this presentation today but I am gonna throw a few at you um, because it's gonna cost you. Unconscious bias, whether it's perceived or whether it's real, it affects your company performance. And you guys need, um, and, and it's, it's important that we understand how it does, does just that. So it impacts your bottom line, okay? It impacts your bottom line, so anyone who is currently doing a, a diversity and or value and diversity or um, an inclusive initiative, it is, it, I just throw my hats off to you because it is something that is going to extremely um, have an impact on your bottom line for the, for the good. So there was a recent study that was done by the Nonprofit Center for Talent Innovation. And so they measured the impact on employees who perceive that unconscious the, um, biases within their workplace. So, how does it impact your un, uh, how does unconscious bias impact your work, workplace? Employees are disengaged. We know that that's 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 common. But how much? Well, 
studies show that disengagement costs you four hundred fifty billion to five hundred and fifty billion per year. That's of course a cumulative amount, but it shows that it costs you because if employees are disengaged because they feel as though that there is some unconscious bias going on in the workplace, then it is going to affect. There are, they are not going to give you the 100% that you want from them. They are going to do just enough just to get by, right? Just so that they don't lose the job. What it also does is it impacts retention. So those employees who perceive biases in the workplace are three times likely to leave their job within a year. And we all know, especially the HR folks on the line and the business owners on the line, we all know how much it costs when we lose an employee. We know how much it costs. So it could greatly affect us. And then it also impedes innovation. I talked briefly about that a minute ago. So employees who were studied said that they are two times, two point six times likely to say they would that, that they withheld ideas, solutions over the over the previous six months that they were, of course, the study uh, had taken place. So over their previous six months, if an employee feels like they cannot voice their ideas or that they cannot be innovative or they cannot provide solutions because they feel like a bias is going to keep them from um, being all they can be in the workplace, right? It's going to impede innovation and that affects your company. That affects your company, which will, uh, which will impact the bottom line. Now, I did put it on this slide, but it's something that I wanted to also bring up because this is basically from the bottom up, how, how unconscious bias impacts the, uh, impact the workplace. So let's think about from the top down. Let's think about unconscious bias from the top down because if there is um, biases within your organization, it also contributes to a lack of diversity in your boardrooms, a lack of diversity in your executive suite. Come on, if you're honest with yourself, you look around you or your, your uh, executive suite or you look around your management team um, and you see that there is a lack of diversity. Well, research clearly shows that it hinders performance. I told you guys, and I'm not going to drudge all that up this time, but in, this, in some of the research that we talked about on our last call, um, it is clear that this hinders the overall performance. If there is a lack of diversity in your organization, it clearly limits the opportunities of the organization to get that edge. Because you want people that are not like you. You want people that think differently because you want to reach that different audience, right? As customers. So, it's important. So as you can see in what we've already talked about, unconscious bias can have a profound impact on your companies. And this is why, especially today, as Katie said in the beginning, this is why um, today and this time companies are taking these steps to go from unconscious to conscious, right? To go from unconscious to conscious. That is something very important for us. So. What are the next steps? What are the strategies for disrupting unconscious uh, biases? What, what can we do as companies to reduce unconscious biases? Well, it's always important to practice confronting biases. And in most of the trainings that I've done in the past, there is always an activity that takes place where uh, individuals are placed in scenarios that um, provide them with different um, opportunities to work through different situations that could create where biases can be created. It's a very eye-opening experience for, um, for individuals 
who attend that type of training because they can be able to really see firsthand if they are biased or not and how they will work through certain situations. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do that today because it's only you know an hour call. But I do want to give us a few things that we could do, a few a few um, approaches that we can take. Just just like there are many um, biases that are in the workplace, we know that there are going to be several different strategies that you can use. And I'm not sitting here saying this is a one size fits all and it's going to fit your organization because every organization is different. But these are some things that I feel is a good start for organizations that want to become more diverse, that want to become more aware um, or more conscious of the biases that could be impeded in their organization. And the first thing to do is to offer the training, right? Offer the training. This is the first step in, in, in your effort to unraveling unconscious bias. It's the first step to offer this training. This is critical in any diversity and inclusion initiative to offer a training. Why? Because employees need a safe place, right? They need a safe place to learn about unconscious bias. They need a safe place to recognize their own biases without feeling as though they're going to be, um, that they're going to be penalized for, um, for confronting their own biases, right? And so it's important for them to have that safe space in order to be able to come up with ways and strategies for them to combat unconscious biases in their day to day, right? And then another one is to, to label the biases that's gonna occur in your organization. What most um, HR, um, what, what most folks do is they go out, they assess the organization, and they they might do um, a survey, they might uh, do some type of assessment, they might have them take lots of implicit um, uh, tests that uh, that Harvard the implicit Harvard test, and they find out what biases are within their organization so that they can actually combat specifically those those biases. So I think that that's important. Again, it goes back to every organization being different. And then developing structures. There has to be structures in place. Structures help the brain slow down. We already said that our brain does what? It uh, com compartmentalizes things, right? It goes with what's familiar. So what we wanna do is we wanna trick the brain by developing structures or policies or procedures to, to, um, to help us when it comes to making decisions, right? So things like decision-making, when we review resumes, when we interview, those types of things need structure. And I think most companies today do have some sort of structure. You know, we, we do have some sort of structure, but you still need to go through those, those uh those uh, structures or those policies that you have and just ensure that there is no way um, where biases can kind of creep in. Understanding again, that we all have bias, right? So it's very important that we develop these, these structures that help us make our actions more deliberate when you know that you have to follow a process or a guideline and it helps us with decision-making. And this is one that is important to me. And this is creating a culture of humility. Because when you think about creating a culture of diversity and inclusion, you need to foster a culture of humility. And it starts from the top down, right? It starts from the top down. And you might say, well, well, Lynn, what is that? What is this culture of humility? This is where you are willing to be uncomfortable. You are willing to sit and listen to someone who may have a different perspective from you, who may be able to explain how they feel as an employee, and it may make you uncomfortable. But your employees need to be able to feel safe in doing that. 
And if they do, and they feel like they're being heard, then you get the most out of that employee. So be willing to be uncomfortable, knowing that you do not know everything is another side of humility. I am, I'll be the first to say, having a PhD behind my name does not mean that I am the, uh, the expert of all things. I know that there are things that I may not know. And especially when it comes to other people, other cultures, right? There are things that we do not know, but our biases cause us to assume and put people in boxes and cause people to, um, to feel uncomfortable even in their own skin. And we wanna create, you wanna, not we, you wanna create a culture where your employees feel okay in their own skin when they come to work, right? You need to, you, you wanna be teachable. Everyone needs to be teachable and you must be willing to own and fix your mistakes. And we talked about that on the last call. The first step is to say, I was wrong, right? I am so sorry. Just like Joanne said, I came back from Puerto Rico, started my business and realized, yes, I do have a bias. And I did, I'm lumping everyone into the same, you know, the same box. But she's willing, she was conscious enough to say, I have this issue and I'm aware of it. So now I'm going to be more intentional. And then we have to challenge the myth of non-bias because everybody has bias. And we've already talked about that. So again, these are just a few strategies that um, I think is a good start to any type of initiative, um, to any type of um, inclusive initiative where you want your employees to, to really truly understand how biases work in the workplace. Um, and you want to have true buy-in, true buy-in. So even when you do training, it's always good to, and this is just not me saying it because I do training, right? It's not just me saying it, research that. Bring somebody in from the outside so your employees can feel safe and comfortable talking about these things. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you want it to you want it to help your organization. You want it to increase your bottom line, and this is a good start in doing that. So everyone on this call today, all twenty two of you, all twenty two of us, we can make a positive contribution to our company. We can do this by rooting out and minimizing unconscious bias, because if we can do this, then we can under, what we can do is we can stop the thing that undermines our diversity and inclusion efforts. And that is the unconscious bias that people bring with them into the workplace. Having this culture of humility, challenging the myth of non-bias, these things guys are all necessary. It's necessary for us and for your company to have this type of initiative that you want to make everybody feel like they're a part of something, right? Providing proper awareness and, and training and putting processes and structures in place, like we've already talked about, guys, this is a good way to identify biases in your workplace. I want you all to succeed. And that's why I come on here, that's why I work with Katie, and um, Amanda, I come on here and I give this information because I want everybody to succeed. I want everyone, everybody's business to be uh, impacted and to make their employees feel like they are uh, inclusive. So just, you know, take the first step. Um, every, every plan is different, you know, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, um, but take the first step. If you want, you can, you know, Give me a call, email me. Um, but any questions? That's all I have because we're about at time. So that's all I have. So does anybody have any questions? And just always keep in mind that specific questions related to your company can all um, can 
be different, right? So it, it can be different and every company needs to be assessed differently. But if you have a question, please, please go ahead and um, ask your question. And so I'll turn it back over to, uh, turn it back over to Katie. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much again for uh, discussing this topic. And, um, you know, I think after every single one of these calls, you have uh, spend the afternoon in self-reflection as you as you go about your day, um, realizing, um, you know, how it applies to you in your daily life. And I think a lot of what we've learned here and and I especially want to um, thank all the participants that are on the call today, whether you are a small business owner yourself um, or whether you are an employee at the city. We have a lot of city managers and directors on here, which I think um, emphasizes uh, how important uh, this, um, and it's not an initiative, it's a culture change. It's a exactly. movement, if you will. Um, exactly. And so it oftentimes starts with initiative because you got to start getting it um, uh, okay. baked in, baked into the, the culture of a community, of an organization, of a conversation. So um, really want to especially call out um, all the city staff that are on the call and, and thank you for, for really um, making this a priority in your day and, and digesting this. So I do want to open it up um, either by selecting raise your hand or unmuting yourself if anyone has any direct questions for Dr. Johnson before we end the call today. All right. I didn't see anyone. That is always, hopefully that's a great sign. <laughs> well, it's, it's a lot of information to digest, but I think it's right. um, a lot of very um, uh, information that can be implemented. So again, I wanna thank everyone for being on the call today. We at the Chamber are going to continue um, this discussion and many other discussions through 2021. We will be continuing a virtual Lunch and Learn series um, in addition to slow rolling back into in-person events. Um, depending on how good we all are as a community. So please wear a mask, stop hanging out together, um, you know, but uh, we will be slow rolling back into in-person events um, and virtual events uh, through quarter one and quarter two of this year. So stay tuned to first thing Monday morning uh, emails. Um, and if any of you at the city do not get those um, or on this call, do not get those first thing Monday morning emails directly, uh, please shoot me or Amanda Joe an email. We'd be glad to uh, add you to that email list. So without further ado, um, I didn't see many of you eating. So go take care of yourself. Start the year right. Go grab lunch. Um, at you know one of our local restaurants, support local, and we will see you all again soon. And again, thank uh -huh. you, Dr. Johnson, for everything you've done for us. No, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a great, great day. Bye. Bye.